Good morning, everybody. We are starting a five day deep dive on stressors. Each day, I'm going to focus on a particular area that um, has multiple stressors that could be causing you to trigger fight or flight. And today, we're going to focus on food because food can be a real, it's like a two edged sword. It can be a stressor on our bodies. And at the same time, we can be stressed and that affects mm. digestion. So that's, it's really pretty complicated. We're going to take <laughs> some time this morning, right, Sue? We're going to take some time this morning, but this is a much longer deep dive. Um, I wanted to bring my colleague, Sue, Dr. Sue McCready on here um, because this is a special area of hers. And so welcome, Sue. Thanks for being here. Oh my goodness. Thanks for having me, Al. It's so fun. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about yourself first, and then we will deep dive it. Sure. So I am Sue McCready, Dr. Sue McCready. I'm a pediatric physician and wellness expert. I basically have focused my entire career on helping children who are kind of falling through the cracks of standard medicine, um, rebalance by aligning their diet and lifestyle with their DNA, which is exactly what we're going to be talking about. And then for the past five years, since so many moms were like, what about me, Dr. Sue? What about me? I realized that this is another way that I'm going to teach you today about eating for your genetics that I also help uh, moms as well. So oh, it's really beautiful. And, you know, when you can clear up one of those, one of those few th or a few things that are really causing you some stress to your body digestively that I can't imagine how that helps, especially a child who, who is just suffering so much and you don't really know why. Um, oh yeah. Life. So I always, I always say it's kind of the foundation. Like I always teach you are what we eat, absorb and release. And so, you know, we're so focused on what's going into our mouth. So, I mean, that was definitely my learning journey of it all. I was so hyper-focused on what I was eating and I was a digestive, like my stress uh, is through my digestive system. So how I kind of stumbled upon this is really through my work of looking for resources for kids, right? In terms of really how to help them further hone in exactly what their best anti-inflammatory diet should be. Um, and then also through my own personal journey. So my personal journey with uh, learning about how to oh, eat yeah. for my genetics came from like a 10 year quest, <laughs> a 10 year quest. So um, I do have, do you want me to keep going? Oh, yes. Yeah. I just muted. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so a uh, 10 year quest for my own journey really started with me becoming a mom actually. And my journey of becoming a mom, um, I had four losses to bring three girls into this world. And now those three girls are one's in middle school and two are in high school and they're all off to school right now, which is, which is great. Um, so it's like a I, miracle. Uh, right. I mean, it's like a miracle, really. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. It truly is. And they, and there's so much embedded even within that story, because all of those losses were something that I could have prevented had I known about this test, eat for your genetics. Like I, so I'll get to that part. Okay. Uh, so, so really um, bringing three babies into this world and those four losses, I crossed the pregnancy finish line, like a digestive distress. Like I call myself hormonal digestive disaster bill. I just like flat out fell across the finish line. And as I was sort of picking up the pieces after my youngest was born is when I went on this 10 year quest of really trying to find the best right diet. So I tried on all these different types of healthy diets. There's so many healthy ways of eating, right? And I was kind of just taking on what my next best friends had to say or what the latest craze was, right? So at the time, those are things like specific carbohydrate diet, paleo diet, whole, whole 30, um, all these different diets, FODMAPs, things that go by acronyms, things that are too hard to pronounce. <laughs> I just <laughs> took on all these different ways of eating. And each one gave me a little bit of benefit, but never like fully release. Like no, my biggest struggles were digestive, um, but also lack of energy, disrupted sleep, sticky pounds. So I, I kind of had a lot of struggle. So when I came upon what I'm going to share with you today, which is eating for your genetics was really at this juncture where 
I used to joke like I should write a blog post. Should we just all eat air? Because <laughs> no matter what type of diet I tried, I seem to still have digestive distress, right? So I was like, maybe we should all just eat air. But that's what I wanted. That's what I wanted to write, uh, which obviously is impossible. So <laughs> I was. I was contemplating doing the keto diet, which if you're familiar with that, is actually a higher fat diet because again, some of my healthy friends were doing that and they were going to start a challenge. And I was thought, Hmm, should I do that? And I thought that could be painful pain in terms of discomfort of learning another way of living and counting how many I like the counter thing. Right. And so I thought, Oh, I don't know if I want to do that, but I was willing to, I was willing to go through the temporary discomfort to get ultimate pleasure. Right. So then I stumbled upon this test, which is really about learning how to eat for your genetics, where they analyze like 125 different of your genetic markers and through the whole field of what we call epigenetics or nutrigenomics. Now we can tell, um, a lot more about how you should be eating. So I stumbled upon this test and what I discovered was I'm like the opposite of keto. Okay. <laughs> so instead of being high fat, I need to be low fat. Right. Um, and instead of low carb, I need to be high carb. And so uh, that was kind of my entry point of like, wow, how many more people can I help? Like how many more people can I just shave years off of their healthy eating? Let me guess the next best thing to do and just get the test done, right? And then help them discover the best way to eat. So that's kind of how I stumbled upon this test. Wow, that is so amazing. Um, I've taken just a, it was a broad genetic test many years ago. Um, and, and one thing that flagged for me was smoked meat. Like I should not have smoked things, you know, and mm -hmm. it's just interesting how, how your genetics can play a role like that. That was my first foray into seeing, oh, how, you know, how interesting that that could be a thing that my particular body doesn't want to have. So right. go and on, then, this is and fascinating. Then, and then, so your, your kind of point, which is how I, how I describe it to, um, you know, moms and kids that I work with is that. I mean, you're, we're the way, one of the ways that Elle and I connected is all about stress because we're, we're like, we're like constantly teaching people about stress and how stress is the number one physiological obstacle to health. Like whether you want to release the sticky pounds or you want to hit harder workouts or you want more energy for people that you love or your work, right. Or if you want to sleep through the night, it's all about stress. Um, and so what I, what I explained to people is that when we're not eating for our genetics, it's like two gears grinding against each other. It creates lots of inflammation, right? And that's very stressful on the body. And so how I explain this to kids is like, once you just let that go, it's like, it's like your body just exhales when you start aligning your diet with your DNA, right? And so that's really kind of diving into where you and I genetically differ the most is in how we metabolize protein, fats, and carbs, right? Those are the three macronutrients, protein, fat, and carbs. Um, and that's why some people can go on the keto diet. Like I have this, this friend couple, also a super healthy couple, love them. And they're always experimenting with different ways. And the wife wanted to go on this keto diet. And so the husband's like, okay, I'll do it with you. And her brain just came alive. Like her brain all of a sudden was like, Oh my God, I can think I can function. Right. Cause the brain is two thirds fat. Right. And right. his brain was fried. He was like, I literally can't put two brain two two cells together right now to make a oh. connection. Right. And so I never tested their genetics, but I'm sure if we looked at their genetics, he needs a lot of carbs to fuel, right. Where she needs a lot of fat to fuel. And so that's where, or like in my practice, how this had came into my practice was a family who came to me for high cholesterol, right? So high cholesterol runs in their family. Mom came in, she has high cholesterol, who her two daughters, um, high cholesterol. And she said, I just have this hunch that there's more to it because at the doctor's office, they just tell, send us to the dietitian who tells us automatically low fat. But this is a mom who's kind of been in the health arena. And so she's like, but I know sometimes fat can be good for you. Right. So she's uh -huh. kind of thinking it through. So I said, well, why don't we test and see? So we tested both sisters, 
right? And one came back low fat and one came back high on saturated fat. Wow. <laughs> so the good fat, right? So we put them both on those different diets, which look different. One was very plant-based because it needed a lot of low fat. And the other was really accessible to um, high amounts of good fat, like nuts and seeds and fish and some, some meat and, and chicken and whatnot. But so we put those different things in and lo and behold, both of their numbers and cholesterol came down. <laughs> so yeah. It's just a testament to say like, it's not a one size all fits approach. Like I always say that would be awesome if I could just tell you eat this, not that, and you'll be great. Like another one is gluten and dairy, right? Gluten and dairy can be your total friend or your complete foe. <laughs> like <laughs> um, just a real like pesky, pesky pattern in your body. And that just depends again on your genetics, which you can see this through this test too. So, you know, um, I am still blown away. I mean, I've been doing this work for over 20 years now with kids and I am still like my jaw will drop at things that resolve once you, once you get things. And also the women that I work with, but once you, once you start removing foods that shouldn't be there. And one of the biggest ones is gluten. Like I would say gluten, dairy, and sugar are kind of the three big enemies. Um, uh, and not for everyone. See, right. that's the thing, not for everyone. I'm always jealous of like when I, I do the report and I'm like, oh, I can't say that gluten is your enemy. I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> My one friend, I was like, wow, you have like the best genetic marker. She's like, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so when we're together, it's just cute. Like she totally prides me on it. It's like, I know, I know. So anyways, gluten, if you, I mean, I think most people have heard of the term now. I mean, it's come so far in the 20 years um, that I've been working with it, even in terms of what you can eat gluten-free taste and texture and uh, has come so far, right? So really adapting our lifestyles. So like in this genetic report, there's seven different genetics um, for gluten. But if you go to your physician, they're likely only going to test for two of them if they test for anything at all. Okay. And so in my my family, we don't test positive for those top two, the, 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 the two that 95% of patients with celiac disease, will, which is lifelong autoimmune issues with gluten mm -hmm. will test positive, but we're all, all of us, the rest, my, all other five of them are flagged on my family. So wow. you can really kind of fall through the cracks, right? Because we're not looking for end disease. Because one of the common objections I get to doing this test is like, oh, I don't want to know Dr. Sue. Like, <laughs> I don't want to know what's in there. Right. Cause then we get all this triggered fear. We get all this fear of like, what am I going to find out? Right. And so I just want to empower people to know that, like, this isn't a test that's diagnosing disease. Like when you go to a geneticist and they're looking for genetic markers that are linked to specific diseases, that's not what this is at all. This is a test that's basically looking at how nutrition how nutrition and our genetics interplay together and really is just a way for you to empower yourself to get the information about your genetics so that you can adapt your diet and lifestyle accordingly. Because in this test, it's not only about food, right? So it's not only about protein, fat, and carbs. So should we be keto or paleo or something in between? Mm -hmm. um, it also looks at chronotype. So our sleep genetics. Okay. So this is another area. Like I fought for so many years. So genetically I'm wired. I'm an early bird. Okay. So I'm one of those annoying people that get up in the morning, <laughs> bounce out of bed. And I'm like, woohoo, I'm so excited. I get my like morning me time. And I got a little, my little cup of chai and my matcha latte and my spiritual readings. <laughs> like everybody's like, whoa, like, why are you up? They're like, your brain's up, right? But for a long time, I fought that as a mom of young, when my girls were younger, I, I just really wanted my own time, even away from my husband, right? God bless him. I love him. He's my best friend. <laughs> but I was also, so I would, try, I would, I would try to beat that. So I'd put all the kids down, right? And then he would be off to bed and then I'd stay up, right? And then 
And, and then I got into a really negative cycle, right? Because mm -hmm. first of all, I was like disconnected from everyone. We were all in this different pattern. And second of all, my brain, like once you missed your kind of magic window. So for early birds, your magic window is, you know, before 10, usually before between nine and 10. If you're a night owl, lucky you, I hung out with some in college. <laughs> their window is between the night and two in the morning. Okay. And the vast majority of people are somewhere in between. So kind of early birds and night owls are the rare, you know, the vast majority I see are somewhere in between, which the magic hour between is like between 10 and midnight, right? And usually if I ask them, like, do you ever hit a time where um, if you go past that time, it's even harder to fall asleep? right? And almost everyone knows what that time is, right? Mm -hmm. Like I can tell you right away, like, it's going to be harder for me to sleep after, if I, after 10, you know, especially after 1030, like, forget it. <laughs> I'm going to have to put a lot of what I call sleep spray or this melatonin blend. I'm going to have to like knock my brain out, right? To get it to <laughs> calm down. And that's also in your genetics, right? So the genetics will show you, are you an early bird or a night owl? Because we have specific times that we should fall asleep, but also our specific, our best work times. Okay. So for an early bird, for me, my best work time is before 12 noon, between 6am and 11am is actually where my brain works the best. So you can actually rearrange the whole schedule of your day based on that. So when I learned that, I was like, why am I giving any of this productive time to anyone else? <laughs> like I right. should be butt in chair and really getting the most productive things done before 11 a.m. Then work out and then start the rest of my day. So it's still a work in progress, you know, but that's how wow. powerful this test can be um, wow. is even with sleep genetics. I want to go back to, to the, um, I, I had a, a call once with a woman in my practice who was Inuit. And she had shifted to, a, again, following fads and following friends, she shifted to a plant-based diet and her body crashed, like everything mm -hmm. crashed. She needed a lot of fatty fish. She needed yeah. that. And I, that was another real clue to me of how important our genetics are. And she was 100% into it. So um, so that's similar to my brother. My brother is a yogi. And so his, you know, his friends and followers, a lot of them are, you know, hundred percent vegan. Right. And so he was living mostly a vegan lifestyle until I convinced him. Cause we're also Nordic. We're from Norway and Sweden, our genetics, and he loves fish, but he was kind of denying the fish because he was following the fad. Right. And so in his do you know the genetic type he came up for was Nordic? That's one of the types which demand a lot of omega-3 fat. And so he was like so excited. He's like, I get to eat my fish. I was oh. like, that's right. Permission to eat your fish. Um, because I think it's a lot of it, like we get a lot of external pressure from the outside world about how it is that we should eat. You know, should is always someone else's agenda for you, by the way. So whenever you oh. hear that I should oh, be say doing that again. This. Say that again. I love this too. <laughs> Should is always someone else's agenda for you, right? So, you know, when I, I whenever see, I hear myself saying should, you I know, I can see, I'm, I'm gonna like, give Judy a moment here. I, I mean, if people are taking notes, please take that down. I see Judy is on Zoom with us here and she's gonna write that <laughs> one down. Should is someone else's agenda for us. That mm -hmm. is so powerful. I'm, I'm keeping that locked away. Judy reminds me. I actually have um, <laughs> this posted up. So let me tell you, because it comes up, right? Another reminder is um, like, like take for instance, your friend or my brother who's the plant based, right? Is the words used to, right? I used to, I used to eat only plants, right? That's like a previous form of you. That's you stuck in the past, right? So bring it to the present. Um, and then the third one that I always need to remind myself, because I'm like the achiever type, it's just like, just do it, you know? And I'm like, how about we just allow it? <laughs> uh, nice. so that all goes along with the should. Those are constant reminders up there, <laughs> up there for me. Um, so, so the other parts of this test, right? It's not only the food part, right? Like mm -hmm. protein, fat, and carbs, gluten, dairy, um, not only the sleep part, but there's actually a whole detox part on that. Um, and so I always teach, we are, what we eat, absorb and release. And some of us are not 
great releasers. Okay. Literally we're constipated. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I've had clients. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and also it doesn't always have to be constipation. It can just mean that you're like a little sponge soaking everything up, but you don't squeeze everything out of your body. Well, so that can just equate to like kind of those in chronic inflammatory patterns, which for everybody is different, right? Mm -hmm. Um, anything from chronic fatigue to low energy to any kind of host of chronic symptoms, right? Um, for me, my biggest was always digestive distress. So we can actually see these detox patterns in the genetics and do something about it. When you work with someone um, like myself, you know, there's actually nutritional ways to help your body squeeze the stuff out when you don't do it well yourself. It's the kind of the bottom line of that. For a lot of people, that was kind of one of my big ahas was that I was so hyper-focused on what was going into my mouth. And I know all of us know people like that. Okay. That was me, right? Like I was just hyper analyzing everything going in, but I wasn't focused on what's getting out. Right. So detoxification and release is equally as important as what's going in. we have to get all the junk out. Even if we're not eating a lot of junk, even if you're a clean eater there, you're still creating waste. You're cells are still eating, absorbing and releasing internally, right? So they're releasing all this waste that you need to get out of your body. So the report goes over that. And I think one of the other things, the hidden gems, it's a hidden gem in this report <laughs> um, is mood. Okay. Mood genetics. A lot of people don't know that our moods are affected by our genetics. Like what? <laughs> So many people don't know that. Okay. There's lots of components to moods, right? And there's a whole other set of things outside of genetics that affect our moods, of course, yeah. but within our genetics, there's genetics called methylation genetics. And that's a big word, but Asian is adding what we're adding our methyl groups and methyl groups technically are carbon surrounded by three hydrogen, but doesn't really mean anything to you and I. So you just think of them like money. Methyl groups are like money. They're like cash flow for your body, right? And what do we do with cash? We spend, save, and share it, right? What do we do with methyl groups? We do the same in our body. So it supports one of the big things that it supports is our brain. So with these methyl groups, we go on to form dopamine and serotonin, which help us concentrate and focus, help us stay in the zone, help us fall asleep and stay asleep, right? They're really, really important for our moods, right? If we don't have enough of those, we can be wired and worried or you know, mentally fatigued and tired. We can be depressed or anxious. So getting a better balance, that's in the methylation genetics. Um, so that does take a little bit of expertise, but if you have that, you know, be more than ha happy to help you with that. Um, it's a hidden gem in there. It's a big gem because most people don't do anything about their methylation genetics and they, they suffer not only with their moods, but it's important for detoxification. It's important for immune health, digestive health, hormonal health, super, super important wow. system. So I would be so fascinated. That's why I love connecting with colleagues like you and people like you. Um, eventually I want to have a lab where we test people. So both the people that are on zoom right now with us, um, Sue are my clients and they've both mm -hmm. worked with me for a while. And it's fascinating to see the changes in us when we're no longer triggering the stress response so much. And how cool would it be to actually have research done on this methylation? Because I, I'm also a brain health coach through Dr. Amen. He talks about the same thing and mm. it's, just really fascinating to, for me to, to know that we can, we can open up so much when we have the information we need to be able to, I don't know. I have clients say I'm finding my true self, not my stressed self. Mm -hmm. It's a very mm. different animal. <laughs> it, it, yes. It's a very different animal. In fact, when you mentioned the constipation, I had a client who um, was a young, a boy, he'd been constipated his entire life. And at our second session, that's not why he came to me. His actually was a heart issue. So we're working, I, I just begin work with him and he comes back the second session and he goes, um, I have to tell you something. He goes, I've been constipated my whole life until this week. And for the first week in his life, he was eliminating well. It mm. was like a miracle. And six months later, he was at his, his regular doctor's appointment <laughs> his mother is texting me and she goes you have to hear what my son just said he said oh take that off my chart this lady helped me get normal 
Oh, I love that. So cute. That's but beautiful. Think of the pain and think of the distress that his constipation is the worst. It'll affect your mood in a nanosecond. Yeah. 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 So this is, this is just really fascinating. So just to recap, like the things that this test does, it's go ahead. It's the food. Yeah. So it's going to look at the foods. It's going to tell you kind of your big, um, there's 25 different diet types, you know, but wow. common ones that you hear of like paleo, Nordic, vegan, right. There's a lot of variations with that within each one, right. Because of the gluten and the lactose genetics, but basically it's going to tell you um, it's going to like narrow your target from like, Ooh, next fat or what my friend is doing to like, boom, you should be eating this way in terms of this percentage of protein, this percentage of fat, this percentage of carbs. And then within that, should you be dairy off dairy? Should you be off gluten? Those are big ones. Um, it's going to tell you about your sleep and your work. So those are chronotypes, your biological rhythm that, I mean, can we just give an amen for how important that is for stress? Yes. <laughs> um, Elle knows that I, I just recently kind of joined a program that she's in, in terms of mentoring program. And it, it, it was stressful, right? Like adjusting to anything new is stressful. And the first thing that went was my sleep. All of a sudden I went back to my old stress pattern of waking up in the middle of the night. And I was like, no, sorry, Bob, <laughs> we're taking that back. Um, oh, wait, that's a really good point. That's a really good point. Mm -hmm. that if you take a new job or you're taking on a new project. Um, Lori is a composer. She'll take on a new commission, you know, that when we're taking on mm -hmm. something new, um, it can really disrupt us. That's a oh. really great point. Yeah. Growth. Yeah. Big growth for sure. Um, and sleep disruption is really a reflection of stress or cortisol, yes. cortisol disruption, right. Which I know you teach so much of, um, and, and that's usually where I can tell, like when I'm working with women, it's like, just tell me about your sleep and I'll tell you about your cortisol, basically. Yeah. Right. So, right. Um, so there's those who can't, you know, who are kind of wired and worried all day. So they just can't wind down and fall asleep, right? There's those who can fall asleep, but then they wake okay. up in the middle of the night because their cortisol bursts too early and then they crash too early. That's my pattern. And then there's those who are just like flatlined all day, right? It's just like, you can't even wake up your cortisol. It's like, are you in there? Like do something, right? Cause it's supposed to be like the energizer bunny, like wake up, you know, and then slowly decrease throughout the day so you can fall asleep. So all those curve cortisol curve disruptions, it's like, that's just a huge sign of stress, which I know I'm sure you teach Al, but that's just like a big, a big thing. And then the other kind of hidden gem in there, which you have to know about is methylation genetics. And it not only can affect your mood, but your ability to detox your hormones. Um, you know, it, it's a lot, your energy, it's a real building block. energy. Yeah. It's yeah. It's a real building block. block. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then another thing, another common question that I get from a lot of people is like, oh, is this like, um, is this like eating for your blood type? You know, that's a common question I get is it's like eating for your blood type and no, because eating for your blood type, there's only five ways and it's not based on genetics at all. Right. This is like 25 different ways and it's based on 125 different genetic markers. So they're, they're totally different. They're, they're not even in the same stratosphere. Um, so I think that, that was the only thing I wanted to mention. It's another common question that I get, but if you guys have any questions, I'm, I'm ha happy to share. I mean, basically, so the process, okay. Like, how do you do this? How, how do you figure this yes. out? Um, well, there's like a three-step process. So if you go to eat for your genetics.com, eat for your genetics.com, eat for your genetics.com, you'll see me <laughs> and I'll explain to you how to do it. Um, because it is a, it is kind of a three-step process. First, you got to get, you know, you got to test your saliva. So it's an easy test. You can do it in less than five minutes. Then you got to get your raw data. You got to download that from one place, upload it to another. That's going to spit you out a report. So I just created this website, eatforyourgenetics.com. So I can walk you through that process. So when you go there, um, I'll walk you through how to do that. Wow, I just dropped it in the link for the people who are on Zoom this morning. Got some nice people here from around the world, which is so cool. <laughs> and um, yeah, so eat for your genetics. Oops, and I spelled it wrong. Let's try that again. That's okay. You got it? Okay. I was just gonna do it. Genetics. Here you go. Com. 
I'm curious, just personally for you, Sue, when you switched your diet based on what you learned for yourself, what were some of the things that you noticed as you went through that transition? One of the biggest things for me, one of the biggest ways that I stress is digestive. So one of the biggest results that I got was digestive ease, right? Um, it's like when I was eating more of a paleo type diet, I was eating a lot of meat, which is saturated fat. And it's really hard for me to metabolize or break down based on my genetics. I don't do well with saturated fat. So what that felt to me was just like, oh, you know, and even today, like, um, I still eat meat, you know, I just don't eat a lot of it, but if someone's going to slap like a pork, you know, taco in front of me with a bunch of <laughs> toppings and some yummy sauces, I might be like, oh, let me eat that. But I will definitely feel it, you know, um, versus it's just so much easier for me to digest plants. So digestive ease for sure, which translation to energy, right? When you're right. contemplated and sluggish, you really deplete your energy. So yeah. those two kind of went hand in hand for me just overall less stress, right. Which always equates into better sleep for me. So those were kind and of the better digestion ones. too. So now you're yeah. actually boosting your digestion even more. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Those were the main things. Um, but you can see, I mean, all different, I mean, for a lot of, Oh, also sticky pounds. Like I started releasing sticky pounds because stress is like your number one obstacle to release sticky pounds. Cortisol just hang on to those pound babies yeah. forever. It's <laughs> if, you have dis <laughs> if you have disrupted cortisol curve, you're going to hang on to your sticky pounds. So that's a big one that I see with women. Um, for kids, you know, so for women, it's definitely um, sticky pounds. You, you can release um, digestive ease for sure. Better sleep, less anxious, right? Mm -hmm. um, you're not worried about your sleep so much. Yeah. A lot less anxiety, less worry, less stress. Mm -hmm. um, so that's an another way for kids because I'm dealing with all of their quote unquote diseases. Right. I right. mean, for kids, I've, I've been able to help kids with this, with, you know, ADD, ADHD, autism, um, anxiety, depression, asthma, eczema. It's like the whole laundry the whole list. Thing. Right? Wow. The yeah. whole thing. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So cool. This is really fabulous. I'm, I'm really, really grateful that you reached out to me. To, mm -hmm. we, were, <laughs> we were on a training together and you reached out to me and now we're connected and I can't even imagine how we're going to be able to help people because it's, um, you have something here that I think is just going to be so valuable to people to get yeah. people on. And, and it's just so basic. It's how we are. It's who we are. And you're finally eating for you. Um, mm -hmm. one client said, one client, one woman said, it's kind of like a tarot card reading with science. Like, <laughs> like when I was reading it to her, she was like, oh my God. Oh, oh, whoa. I kind of knew that. And that's usually what happens when I do, when I do these readings, right. Is that, um, maybe I should market it that way. It's like a tarot card reading. So that's be funny. Um, people be like, Ooh, I think I want that. But she, a lot of what happens when I do these is that people confirm what they already know. Oh, Let's just say that again, people confirm what they already know. Mm -hmm. Right. So when I ask them, I show them their gluten genetics and I'm like, yeah, I kind of knew that. I was like, really tell me. She's like, well, when I eat that, it's like digestive, like, Whoa. right. So it's just, but that, but that's important because because it reassures us, right? Because a lot of times we doubt our knowing, right? right? And so when we see something in black and white that confirms it, it gives us permission to just move forward and tell other and explain to other people why you're choosing um, to eat this way, I think was a big thing. Um, another thinking of that particular client with that, another thing that you can see on these genetics are called APOE genetics, which are, are associated with neurological conditions and um, chronic inflammatory states. And one of the big things with APOE, it actually gets a lot of press because of Alzheimer's. Okay. Um, and that's one of the genetic markers for Alzheimer's. It doesn't mean like you're gonna have Alzheimer's if you're APOE positive. Sure. However, a lot of people what we're moving towards is how can we prevent Alzheimer's from even happening, right? And APOE genetics is really about um, eating a low saturated fat diet. So if you have neurological you know, conditions in your family, like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, neurodegenerative diseases of any types, right? 
that's, that's a big indicator for you, like to get tested, see that you have that and then really focus. So this particular client that I'm thinking of her, both her parents had that, right. And so she's just been given this great gift. She's like, oh my God, if I just adopt this low fat lifestyle eating, right. Still get some healthy fats in there, but really focus on that because of my APOE genetics. <laughs> it's like you take, instead of going off this trajectory, right. You're going down this way. That's the power of this test. I, I want to take this a little deeper with the science. So, um, I did some research on epigenetics and stress particularly, and how, um, when we are stressed, even with just a negative thought and think about the negative thoughts that people spin all the time, we're wearing down our telomeres and that's when gene variants can express. So you have so much more ability to, with your genetic code to do things with it. It's not mm -hmm. completely fixed. So there's ability. In fact, one scientist I was reading said, it's like, we only touch, we are only working with a small amount of the libraries that are in this code. And mm -hmm. when we start to, to make these little shifts, we've relieved so much stress that would cause our material to break down our, you know, the breakdowns to happen. Does that make sense? It's like, we're not, it does make down. sense. Yeah. And when I think telomere frame, so for those of you, like yeah. I heard an example of telomeres is like, they're like the, the end caps on our chromosomes and they're really what's associated with aging. Um, and they're actually like the best visualization I've been taught is, they're kind of like at the end of a shoestring, they're that plastic cap at the end of a shoestring, right? So oh. if that cap breaks down, then your shoestring starts fraying, right? I'm like, <laughs> oh, I get that. Yeah. Um, so that's actually what's associated with accelerated aging is the fraying of the telomeres. There's actually like people always say to me, Sue, it's like you're, you're aging in reverse. I'm like, right. yeah, dude, because I take a lot of antioxidants to protect those telomeres, right? Yeah. So so there are daily things that you can do, right? To, to protect the end caps, um, yes. lots of different types of antioxidants that support that as well. So, but yeah, that's the whole telomere thing. The power of it is that there's so much that we can do, right? Yes. Um, are you willing to do it is the are question, right? Are you wow. willing to do it? Let's see, um, Drulona had a question here and, and there's, there are definitely things, I help a lot of people with sleep um, mm -hmm. Lori's on here. I know that Lori, uh, Lori just had a major change with sleep when we were together. I mean, it's so cool. <laughs> she announced the other day that, that she's gained three hours in her day. Just because now it's like mm. amazing when you finally get a good night's sleep and yes. stuff. Um, but yeah, so that's her question is what controls can be done for sleep problems? And I, I think what you're saying is figuring out your patterns is the first thing. So some things, some things are, are lifestyle, right? So you right. need to know what your chronotype is. So lifestyle changes are, you need, like I, what I call it is you need to respect your sleep genetics. Like you need to pay them homage. Like you need to say, you know what? I honor you. For me, that is, I honor that I'm an early bird. If I want to do, for me, it's like, if I want to do God's work during the day, cause that's why I'm here, right? I'm here to be love in action. If I want to do that, then I need, then I need to pay respect to my genetics. So for me, that's going to bed by 10 o'clock, sometimes 1030. And of course there are exceptions. Like when we go out and celebrate or we're with friends, right? So it's not like you have to be like this rigid, you know, dry, <laughs> crusty thing. That's not fun. It's just that the vast majority <laughs> of the time you're going to follow that, right? You're not going to set up a routine. Like I shared with you before where I'm doing work right before I go to bed. Like that is the worst case scenario for an early bird. So part of it is just paying respect to your sleep genetics, testing what that is. And in the same light, also controlling your work time, right? So for me as an early bird, I don't do any work after six o'clock. Like I, I stop there because it takes me that amount of time to just, first of all, I want to be present with my family, right? I, I want, I want to be with them. That's also my work here. <laughs> it's one of my roles as a mom. I want to be present and not distracted and stressed out. Um, so I don't do any work after six o'clock and my friends will even tease, like you don't even text you after nine o'clock. And I've actually switched it just recently. Like you, I don't even see any notifications after seven o'clock unless I manually go in there and do it. So that's just another way to help me continually wind down. Right. So if you're a night owl, you could extend that later and all those hours are in the, 
in the testing. So there's definitely a lifestyle component to it. The other aspect of regaining sleep, in addition to everything that Al does, right, yeah. is, is that um, really getting that cortisol to behave, you yeah. know, is through um, the plant-based way to do that is through plants called adaptogens. Adaptogens are a classification of plants that help us better adapt to stress. And like, you cannot overdose on adaptogens. And I use adaptogens liberally throughout the day. And adaptogens can give you energy, right? So I can use them between two and four. If I didn't get a good night's sleep, um, they're gonna pet me up, right? But they can also wind you down right? So they're going to adapt to what you need. And that's really my big, big tools for women helping with them with their sleep is I got to help normalize their cortisol with adaptogens. And then I got to help them, you know, pay honor and respect to their sleep genetics, whatever that takes. And usually the big thing is, is that when we're not honoring what it is that our diet and lifestyle demand, it just means that we're not plugged into our deeper why or our purpose, like our WHY, like we're just not plugged into it. Because if you are really plugged into it, you you really need to be fully present to plug, to plug into that during kind of the working day or if part of your why is also parenting, right? The full day. I mean, it takes tremendous amount of energy to do all that, right? Um, and so I, that's another thing that I work with women about is like, they're usually coming like, I want to lose 10 pounds, but I take them through this exercise of like, but why are you really here? And it usually comes, it's always about somebody else. It's, we'll do way more for somebody else than we'll ever do for ourselves. So it usually is about being a, being a, you know, someone else, either being a parent, you know, or being a best friend or being, you know, an intimate partner to someone or for God or for God's work, or there's usually something bigger, right? And so it's just about plugging into that to get you geared for it to do what I call the temporary pain for the ultimate pleasure. <laughs> I want to ask a little, so <clears throat> as a professional musician, Everything shifted for me in 2010 when I created Pressure Free and started using it on myself because I'm an early bird, but I have to stay up till 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night and perform well. Mm. Like I had yeah. to, and I see Lori nodding because that's what we have to do. So I'm an early bird and I always have been, you know, I rode for Michigan. So I'm up at 4.30 in the morning, going to bed at 8.30, you know, like very early during a lot of part of, of my life. And so my, I would get very anxious that I would not perform well because I had labeled myself an early bird. And so it was like in 2010, I let go of the label and I, I really noticed, okay, if I don't release those stress hormones before I go to rehearsal, I'm going to have a great rehearsal. I started mm -hmm. playing with it and by not, and then I sleep well, I get home and I like instantly go to sleep instead of waking up all night thinking of Copeland or, or Bernstein, whoever were performing that night, Brahms all night long in my head, right? Can't go to sleep. So it was a whole big shift for me because of course we're a concert cycle. We're rehearsing every night, but I'm still up early in the morning, getting my kids to school, doing all the stuff. So it was like a watching that accordion open up because I no longer was stressing that I wouldn't be able to do it. Mm. But then, that was huge for me. I had so many, I put so many limiting beliefs on the fact that, you know, I don't know how I'm going to survive this. And when I was running the symphony, I wasn't performing. Uh, my conductor and I would both become ill after every performance. We'd finally get done the whole two weeks of boo, 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 like, you know, all of this big time. And then we get ill. And after one of the, the concerts where this happened, I were on the phone together and I go, Matthew, we're going to stop this. <laughs> Let's not do this anymore. We're making ourselves ill, working early morning to late at night, over and over and over. Like, oh, an owl just went by. Sorry, shiny object. Um, so, so really just understanding back to Jolona's question, um, noticing that you're, that you're triggering the stress response about time, about time of day, or let's say you, I love how you brought up the celebrations. Like you have a party. I used to be the one that left early because I wouldn't even give myself that time of celebration. And at our son's wedding, 
we danced for hours. Like it was the greatest wedding. It was just amazing where I danced almost the entire time for like five hours straight. And then we're going to go over and have a campfire because they rented an entire Girl Scout camp. So we're going to go have this campfire and strum guitars and sing, right? And, and it's like, now two in the morning I said oh I think I need to go to bed and my son grabs my arm and goes mother you are coming (laughs) you are coming and I'm like how many times did I go off to bed and miss maybe the best thing and so I went and it was because I I'm gonna get cry here (laughs) it's because I allowed myself the fun and I think some of us mm-hmm. are so high, so high achieving and so strict with ourselves. Do you know what I mean? And, and I think that, um, that allowing ourselves to have that time to celebrate and allow ourselves to have the fun. And, um, and this is such a great component because if you understand, like if you ate all the right foods during the whole day, your body's going to give you the energy you need to have that fun in the night if you're an early bird. And I live, there are three in our home that are nighttime people. Two of us are early birds and three are, are more scared. To, they can work all night. I could, I never could do that. I never pulled an all nighter except to give birth. It's the only time I pulled all nighter. <laughs> it's the only time. <laughs> never in college. I never pulled an all nighter ever. I don't think so. I did either. Oh, and my wedding night. I stayed up all night on my wedding night. I didn't stay up all night on my wedding night either. (laughs) (laughs) It's really funny. It's cute. It's fun. I love that. We've my hope this past our time, but I I want to make sure um, if if Lori and Judy are here live with us or anybody else have a question that you want to ask, you can feel free to come out and ask. And we are live, so we're recording too. So. Oops, Judy, you're muted. Let's unmute you. I'm in the middle of doing bioenergy testing. I did do a gene test, methylation, um, and a lot of that was slow. So she's working on getting it up um, and finding out that I need more high fat, good fats, amino Mm -hmm. acids, stuff like that. And I, I was always hitting a wall of not being able to lose weight. And for my size, I'm five feet, I claim, but sometimes a little less than that as well, I'm a runway to weight and I'm 66 years old. So um, I have been able to get the weight off, but this to me, um, she's trying to fine tune this testing she's doing has fine tuned enough to know, give me direction what to do. And yours also makes complete sense. Um, mm-hmm. even more detailed to me. Um, so uh, I've taken all this testing now ready. Um, mm-hmm. uh, how much oxygen, how you utilize oxygen, how much oxygen you get into a cell and how also you can get all this good stuff into the cell, but also eating right. But the um, sleep and, and the work, all that doesn't really address that. This testing doesn't address that. So it's kind of like an unknown. To me, um, Al's way of doing things is really great, but your equation with that and finding out how to do that helps a person actually um, know what's best for them yeah. and, mm-hmm. and to be the best they can. And uh, just, mm-hmm. just knowing that. So That's I don't know what you think about that. If you even heard of it, it's called bioenergy testing. Yeah, I mean, so there's a lot of, I mean, that's kind of my world, right, as a, as, a, as a medical doctor, pediatric physician, that I do all the kinds of different testing for kids, right? So yeah. we can do a lot of expensive testing. I mean, that's, that's kind of the route that it, there's really cool things. Like, I always say to my patients, it's like, yeah, I want that data. That data would be fun, right? Yeah. Um, it, what I find, what I find, and also, and also, what I find is that it's usually the horse, you know, not the unicorn or the zebra, as we say. It's usually, it's usually pretty simple, and we don't have to do it perfectly, right, to get the results that we want. So my suggestion is, you're getting a lot of great information, and you make the shifts, right, that you're yeah. already experiencing. And then, as I say to my clients all the time, it's like if you're not getting your final results, right, then take the next step, 
right? Okay. Then explore, like explore what other data you can find to further kind of fine tune and zero, zero it in. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Did you have any questions for her, Lori? No, uh, not yet, but I want to find out everything. Because, <laughs> <laughs> because I have not unlocked uh, I just looked at her website, but I have not unlocked all the secrets of how I, you know, I have figured out how I can start my day earlier and and not drop off and I keep going, but I still think I am a night night owl, but um, mm -hmm. but I want to be more productive still <laughs> so I'm, like hungry for that. <laughs> And the, the whole thing about the mood altering um, part part of it, I think that's got to play a big role too. Powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. This is so fun. Well, thank you so much. Yes. Thank you for those of you who are willing to ask questions and come on live. And for those of you watching on Facebook. Brave soul. So <laughs> yeah, early in the morning here for you nightbirds, right? <laughs> yeah, it's like, whoa. <laughs> I knew when Elle scheduled an 8 a.m. Zoom, I was like, oh, she's an early bird. <laughs> <laughs> Even though you don't want that label, Elle, I'm just uh, going to say. I know, I, I know. That's my first thought. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. One of my, uh, the coach that you and I work with, she asked one of her colleagues to come on at 7 a.m. Pacific time, right? And he said, that must have been a typo because he's a night person. It must have been a typo. There's no way she wants me on it. <laughs> so, so we are different in honoring those differences within families, I think is really important. Um, mm -hmm. You know, first, I really didn't understand my husband and, and how, how he, you know, his, I criticized it. You know, I was like, come on, we got to get up. I, I grew up in a house where you're up at 430 every morning. <laughs> like, my whole family was, you know, my parents were that way. And so. I just didn't really understand it. Like he's missing half the day and, and no, he's, he's shift. He's, he works amazing in those nighttime. He's a creative and he works amazing in those nighttime hours. And so it's fun to play with, but this has just it been is. so informative and yes. so fun. Thanks. So thank you thank so you much. Sue. Yeah, you're welcome. And to Reach out, you guys, if you need any help or questions. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Eatforyourgenetics.com is how you can connect to Dr. Sue McCready. And um, tomorrow we're going to dive deeply on stressors that involve children. And I'll include pets in there too, if you don't have children. So <laughs> children's stressors and um, family stressors is what we're going to dive deep on tomorrow. So I will Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> Exciting topic. You the puppy <laughs> stressors. There's, the, there's her dog right there. <laughs> <laughs> right on cue. Right. right on cue. I love that. All right. Well, have a great day. Great pressure free day, okay. everybody. And we will see you tomorrow morning. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.